Good afternoon, and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org. I'm Scott Adams, creator of the Dilbert comic strip and your moderator for today's program. I'm now pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Greg Guffeld, host of Fox News, The Greg Guffeld Show, co-host of Fox News, The Five, and author of the new book, The Gutfeld Monologues. <laughs> Classic rants from The Five. <laughs> Greg Guffeld is an admitted outrageous and outspoken libertarian political satirist, humorist, magazine editor, and blogger. <clears throat> Greg started with Fox News in 2007 as a contributor and hosted the late night show Red Eye from 2007 to 2015. <laughs> On the Greg Gutfeld Show, he parodies current events, bringing a comedic twist to the news. On The Five, Greg is part of a roundtable ensemble of personalities who discuss and debate the hot news stories and controversies of the day. Greg is the author of eight books, including his newest, The, Gut the Gutfeld Monologues. Gre Greg grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and attended UC Berkeley, the best school ever. <laughs> the Weekly Standard has called him... Oh, yes. The Weekly Standard has called him the most dangerous man on television. Going on to say, Gutfeld's stuff actually is subversive. A stink bomb hurled into every faculty lounge, mainstream newsroom, movie studio, and nonprofit boardroom in America. So buckle your seatbelts and welcome to the Commonwealth Club, Greg Gutfeld. First off, I better get more applause than Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Tucker, you, if you, you already know Tucker's stick, right? Which is just basically to stare into the screen like a dog staring at a butcher shop. <laughs> and then after he eviscerates somebody, he goes, thanks for coming on. <laughs> Thank, thanks for coming on. Have you mastered the Tucker stare? Yes, I, the I Tucker stare. It's, it's just like... <laughs> it is, it, it's like a dog staring at laundry in a dryer. I love Tucker, though, in a totally platonic way. <laughs> or maybe not. Who knows? And who cares? So, Mind your own business. So, yes, sorry. continue. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm having a conversation with myself. It happens. So we've got some questions. We've got some questions from the publisher. Uh, they're kind of safe. They've got some edgy, <laughs> brilliant questions from me. And even better questions coming in from the audience. But I'd like to start with the... Uh, the questions from Greg's publisher. Yes. <laughs> yeah. those, those questions, not so interesting. Yes. Um, Greg, now that you're a big deal, you've got two television shows. I understand that the, uh, that, uh, the Greg Gutfeld show is number one on cable news now? It, on Saturdays, we beat the competition, which isn't very hard when you have like 16 episodes of Forensic Files. And, uh, you have six, and, I think... Uh, Headline news is all forensic files, right? <laughs> it's all serial killers. They all look like the MyPillow guy. And, and then you. <laughs> but uh, no, we, the, the important thing is that on Saturday nights, I beat Jesse. You right? That's, it's important that I beat Jesse. What's wrong with that? That's what counts. All right. Lighten, lighten up. It's just now, Jesse. Him and his hair. Now that you're so well known, especially now with your book and all, and your tour, do people recognize you in public? How, how does that go? Um, it's interesting because the weird thing about being at Fox, it's like you're in a specific band that everybody loves or nobody knows, right? <laughs> it's like it's if you watch Fox and you know who I am. If you hate Fox, you don't know who I am. But then there's this weird little overlap of people who like maybe there was some kid visiting his grandparents. And I was on TV, and they're like, I'm yelling, and they're like, who is that person? I hate that person. That happened today, so I got off on the plane. This guy said, I think I know you, and then I knew where it was going, because then he st it started to dawn on him that I was the Antichrist. 
but the best, the best one was at, I was at Newark Airport. My wife was flying in from somewhere, and I was flying in from somewhere, but I got there first. So we were, I was waiting at a bar at Newark, and this dude was like, like right across from me, and he just kept staring at me, and he was giving me the I hate Fox News stare. <laughs> and he was like a little bit older than me, and he was drinking a beer, and I, go, and I could see that he was working it up the the stuff and so I was uh I go here it comes and he gets up and he walks over to me and he gets very close to me and he says um I just want you to know that I think the place that you work for, you should be ashamed of where you work it is a disgusting environment and in, in, in a horrible place and I'm thinking it can't get any worse than that what's he gonna do and he goes TMZ has ruined so many lives <laughs> I'm like I'm thinking, I look like Harvey Levin. I mean, it's like he's like a stunted version of uh, Jack Lalanne. I realized, I realized though that I, because the guy was really rude, that I missed the opportunity that I, if I had actually punched him, he would have told the police with 100% certitude that it was Harvey Levin. I, I, I had the opportunity to beat up a stranger in a bar, and I totally blew it. Oh, man. Anyway, we got married. We're living in Vermont. <laughs> Everything's good. Not true. Um, so, and who cares if it is? <laughs> all right. So for those of don't, who don't know what the Guffeld Monologues book is about, obviously he has your best hand-picked monologues, but is it so much more? Tell there us, is so much more. Tell us what else. Well, um... I got a lot of stuff wrong. I got a lot of stuff right and a lot of stuff wrong. And I thought, I was reading my monologues and I just thought, you know what? This, it's not, it's too easy just to publish them. So what I did was I started heckling my own stuff. So I'm reading my, my monologues and I'm going, well, that's a really stupid joke. And then I go, well, why don't I write that? That's a really stupid joke. And then I was reading a part, I go, well, that really didn't happen, did it? Like I, I felt kind of guilty about being too hard on Bernie Sanders. And so I was like, I, you know, I was falling on the same kind of stereotypes of, that you would use to insult liberals, you know, saying they smell like patchouli and, and whatnot, <laughs> which is largely true. But I felt that I was being too harsh. And so I ended up writing commentary. So it's like two books in one. It's like a Reese's peanut butter cup of great literature. So it's... So some commentary and some self-hate. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> the story of my life, actually. <laughs> now, if you only read one book this year, you would be exactly like me, because I've read exactly one book this year, which is actually true. I'm a skimmer. But I read this entire <laughs> book because I find it very voicey. If you haven't heard that term, it's a sort of a writer industry term. It means you can pick up the personality of the author. And that's sort of your trademark, is that your personality is all through the, all through the writing, so it's really easy to stay with it for a long time. Uh, but can you describe your writing process? I heard you talk about layers one time, and I know everybody likes to write better. Mm -hmm. Like, what, What's that process of layering writing? Well, I mean, there's a couple of things. The, the first thing I do is uh, I, try to, I try to see what's out there, and I try to figure out what no one else has said. So if there's, let's say it's something about um, Trump's tweets and it's like everybody's freaking out, freaking out, freaking out. You try and you do this on your periscopes too. You figure out, okay, what is, what is being overlooked? Now, obviously anything could be overlooked and be absurd and wrong. I could say, you know, obviously he's from outer space or something, say something stupid. But it, the first thing you have to do is come up with the thing that no one else has said. And the second thing is to make sure that that thing exists in everybody else's head. So that when it happens, they go, exactly. <laughs> like if they hear it on TV or if they read, they go, that's exactly what I was going to say and what I was thinking, but actually he said it better. And that's the, so the goal is to come up with something no one said, but that it already exists. And I call it the unspeakable truth, that it's, it's, every, it's in everybody's head, but it just takes you know, me to come up there and crack it open and pull it out. So that's the goal. If it's boring, um, I, 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 will, I will throw it away. But also, I guess the next layer is to make it funny. And I think that's the, the important thing is because funny is generally memorable and it makes, uh, it makes the truth memorable, I guess. Now, you probably write more than just about anybody I know. Your, your quantity is, is great. It's all commercial grade, great stuff. How do you produce that much? Is there a time of day you write? I write, in, I write uh, monologues in the morning when I get up around 9 a.m. I'll make a strong pot of coffee. And sometimes they'll send me options to write. And so I'll, I, and I can write a monologue probably in like, I don't know, 15 minutes. 
But that sounds like I'm bragging because for the next four hours, all I'm doing is I'm, it's like Jenga or something. I'm rearranging the words and I often make it worse than it was. And then I start all over again and then I end up back where I was, but I'm constantly editing it and putting it and taking it apart. Then when I come home at night, so that's, that's generated by coffee and then the writing at night is generated by alcohol. So that's, uh, that's so I, it's, it's like I have a reward system. I have to have a reward system with writing or I can't do it. I have to have coffee while I'm writing and I have to have booze while I'm writing. And if I write something really good, I drink, I drink like you know, a couple of gulps of wine and then I can keep drinking. And I notice it's the same level of like, I know when to stop writing when I'm drunk. I, I noticed that when I was reading the book. It was like, oh, <laughs> coffee? It's true. That's, uh, that's coffee? Well, that's beer. Yes. That's beer. <laughs> You can tell the repetition. It's like he obviously doesn't remember. He just said that earlier, just like a typical drunk. All right, I want to read you two of my favorite parts from your, your book, some, uh, some uh, descriptions of people, and I want to ask you about these. Well, and the uh, first one is about Hillary Cl Clinton, and you said, quote, Hillary is the patch of stale carpeting in the basement that absorbed all the spills around it, and yet it never actually gets dumped. It just gets moved around to another part of the room. <laughs> And then, and then my second one, just so you see this is, you know, uh, nobody is safe. It's about Steve Bannon. You said that Steve, Steve Bannon is a circus peanut left out in the sun on a minivan dashboard. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I have no idea. But he just reminds me of a circus peanut. The kind of the color and the texture. Do you guys know what a circus peanut is? Uh, Very careful how you say it, because it could come out in a different way. It's that really horrible spongy candy. No, yeah, you, am I that old? Yeah. All right. Yeah, but um, Hillary, is, Hillary is the gift that keeps giving because you can come up with analogies, metaphors, and descriptions for her because just by the virtue of her never going away, you can always come up with something new and, uh, and fresh. And she is kind of this person that's always here that we move over here and then that, uh, that doesn't work, so we move her over here and it just never seems to work out. Everybody has had that carpet. Now, what, the, the thing I wanted to point out about this, because is anybody interested in writing, like the writing process? Does anybody care about that? Okay, no, nobody cares about that. <laughs> just, just checking in. We've got a long time. That's okay. We'll skip that. But, um, Any hobbies out there? I can. <laughs> but know how visual it is. You can, you can see it, but you can also smell it. Mm -hmm. Like, I, that's what I like about your writing. I can see it, I can feel it, there's a movie, and then I can smell it. That's very... Provocative. You know, it's... it's, it's because the thing is, like, the, at 5 o'clock, i got to make sure it doesn't smell too much. You know what I mean? Because I, do, I tend to, like, the criticism is that I get a little too bodily. And I save <laughs> those jokes for Saturday when I get really disgusting. But, like, on the 5, it's like I'll say, I'll say something that is a little bit, like, in that world. And you can hear the audible gasps of Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Although Dana has a filthy mouth. <laughs> she does. We know. <laughs> We all, we all heard what she said about a man with a pet. <laughs> Called him an asshole. And, and uh, only because he had an alligator. If it was a, if it was a beautiful dog, she would have said something else. But I'm, Did you see that? Uh, the, you watched The Five. I, I watched Did you see what she swore? I missed that. Oh, it was How amazing. There was a video of a guy. It was a one more thing. A guy was walked into a liquor store with an alligator, and he was wasted, and he let the alligator out. And like everything's, you know, everything's normal on the show. By the way, I wasn't on the show. I was doing a remote and the, the alligator got up and you just heard, what an asshole. <laughs> and it's like, and everybody just goes, where did that come from? <laughs> it, was a, it, was like, it was like a sonic boom, you know? It was like, every, and it was like, and then and they go back to her and it's like, she, I don't even think she, it, she knew that she had said it. Like it was like something that had just jumped out of her. She's going to tell me not to say the A word anymore. Apparently, this is going on C-SPAN, so Brian Lamb is going to write me an angry letter. You're in very much trouble. Stop now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, let, me, let me try one of these. Yeah. Um, oh, this is, this is good. How important is the truth these days? Ooh. I like that one. That's actually okay. It's a very good point, because that's more about what you do. And what I've learned from you, in a way, uh, I was during the whole, uh, uh, and I have friends here, by the way, that I've talked to about Trump while we were talking about Trump on the five, and how I was hypercritical of him. He was driving me crazy. He was saying stuff that, like, 
let's face it, I've said worse. But he was running for president, and, and, and I was like more obsessed with his words because there were no deeds yet because he, was, he hasn't, wasn't president. But I'd become more and more like uh, emotionally invested in his behavior, which um, was kind of a waste of time. And I realized from, I think I, I, when I came across a book, uh, this guy Charlie Munger had recommended a book by Cialdini called Influence. And that was uh, kind of the art of per persuasion. And when I read that book, I started to see what Trump was doing. And I started to look at him less as a political figure and more as a host of a comedy roast. And what he had done was he had basically redefined every context he was in. So when he was, at, when he's like, this is how hypocritical I was. In this, in this whole thing. During the first debate, when uh, Megyn Kelly asked that first question, and it was like, you know, and says, uh, uh, Mr. Trump, you've said some very horrible things about women. You've called them these names like pigs and whatever. And his response was, to be fair, it was Rosie O'Donnell. <laughs> and, and, and it might have been, it might have been the greatest debate answer in the history of debates. <laughs> Going back to Lincoln Douglas, I was sitting there, I, and I think you had the same experience. I was sitting there with a buddy of mine who's a cop and my friend of mine who's a, a, a producer and a restaurant owner, and we just, I just step up and I go, that's amazing. I just go, that's amazing. I go like, I, how can you not love that? There's like 17 people, and it's the contrast theory of like you have 17 similars and one difference, and he just stood out. But then the next day, you know, I get to work, and I, all of a sudden I became like something else, which was, ugh. That's non-serious character, Donald Trump. Um, he's rude, he's crass, he's not, he, he's, there's no way he's gonna last. And I, had, I basically purged what I, my gut feeling about him was that this guy was unique, but I purged it all. And I thought like, no, what you need is a, um, you know, a Rubio. I was a Rubio guy, but I realized that I was a hypocrite because I'd, I'd opened a speech for Trump years ago in which I was probably more crass than he was and that all he was doing was he was adopting kind of the practices that he had learned from Comedy Central into this arena and he was saying, I don't care. He, was, he didn't care and it's like, if you ran or if I ran, if you're honest, you would run as yourself and that's what he was doing. And the other thing I realized was that anybody else who won, if you think that Rubio would be treated any better than Trump, you're wrong because he's pro-life. They would have eaten him alive. Look how they treated Mitt Romney in uh, 20, was it 2012? Like, um, because he cut some kid's hair, you know? Huh. He put a dog on a roof. I mean, <laughs> where, I'm come from, where I come from, that's a hood ornament. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but so my point is, I don't know what my point was, Scott. You asked me a question about truth. You asked me about truth, and I rambled incoherently. Oh, Donald Trump, Donald Trump didn't have the truth, right? He didn't have the truth. But what he did was he was coloring in the right circles. But he was col coloring outside the circles a lot, so he'd get some things wrong. But he picked the right circles. You know, he, he you know, uh, the, the, I call it the, like the stool of law and order. You know, he had, he had police, he had national security, he had borders. And he, he just said, like, he could have been wrong on the statistics, but he got that right. And it, that became persuasive in a way. And, and he used humor in a way that I was using on the five. And I, and I look back now and I go, okay, I got, I got tied up in his language. Once he became president, I, 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 could, I could get tied up on his deeds. I, stopped, I said, I already get his language. I don't need it. Any, I, I get it. He's going to tweet. What are you going to do? But look at his deeds. And when you look at his deeds, you know, it's, it's not a lot to complain about. When he pulled out of that climate change thing, I'm like, yeah. That was like the first thing. And then I, you, know, you started watching other things happening, and you're, you're going, okay. So he's a jerk. You know, I'd I say this. I'd would you rather have a doctor who's got great bedside manner, but he loses a patient a day. You know, it's like, it's like the reason why a doctor has great bedside manners because he has to practice it. You know, he's got, he's, he's got to give a lot of bad news, but <laughs> Trump, has no bedside, Trump has no bedside manner. And maybe because he, he didn't think he needed it. So I'd rather have a jerk who's good with a knife. <laughs> that could be taken out of context, C-SPAN. <laughs> 
do you see anybody on the left who's coming up or already up who has the same kind of persuasion skills? Um, yeah, a couple of people. I like, I, I'd say Kamala Harris seems pretty, uh, she's pretty together. I know, I'm not talking about ideas. I'm just talking about somebody who can, who, who, who can get up there and argue. I think somebody has to have a sense of humor, and that's the hard part on the Democrat side right now. There's nobody as funny as Trump. Right. But a lot of people keep saying Biden, and, but I just don't know if, if Biden's going to be able to keep up with Trump because, you know, it's, Trump is just a freight train. He's an orange meteor, you know. <laughs> um, and uh, and, and um, the other person I was thinking of, and people laugh at me because the name recognition isn't very good, but I was watching that uh, – that progressive rally with Mark Ruffalo. Remember that actor? Mm-hmm. I love him. He's a great Hulk. <laughs> but he was pretty good. I have to say that as uh, he was positive. And, you, and what the Democrats need right now is a positive person, not a negative person. But I, I, it's slim pickings. I thought you were going to talk about Alexandra. Oh, Octavio, Octavio Cortez. Whose name I can never say yeah, correctly. She's, um, I think she's got charm. Uh, and I think she's got the charm and the energy and she's going to win. So I think like there's no way she's going to lose in, in, uh, in that, uh, in that p- part of New York city, but I don't think she's, she doesn't have the f- truth yet or the facts. So well, well, but, will it matter? Will will it matter? matter? That's the, that, it's true. So you probably saw a tweet in which uh, Ben Shapiro uh, challenged her to a debate for yes. $10,000 and she responded, I don't respond to cat calling. Yes. Now, was that not a Rosie O'Donnell move? Yeah, it was great. <laughs> it just totally took the debate out of you don't know anything to is this an issue about catcalling, and that's all anybody wanted to talk yeah. about. Yeah, I mean, I disagree with it, but I admire it. I mean, it was like, it is kind of like the go-to now. It's like just just shout sexism. And, and people are so scared these days of being labeled uh, sexist or racist that you can probably chase anybody out of a room. But yeah, that was, calling it catcalling was, was pretty... And then also, just imagine Ben Shapiro catcalling is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, I can't do an impression of him, but I, hello there, young lady. You look mighty, uh, mighty attractive. <laughs> uh, would you like to discuss the, uh, the consequences of progressive socialism? <laughs> and uh, over at my place, we have a, a cappuccino machine. We have, uh, I might have some wine. I can probably get some wine. I can call, call a place and get some wine. Uh, I can listen to that. Is that a day, decent but... impression? I don't know. <laughs> I love Ben. Very good. I did his podcast yesterday. It was, it was fun. I don't know why I brought that up, but it's, well, that's uh, probably... I would share. <laughs> All right, here's a question from the audience. It says, most regulars on Fox News seem happy. Is it like a family, or do you, I'll add my own commentary, or do you all just hate each other? <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, it's, I, we've talked about this at some point. Uh, if you, it's, Fox News is different because the people who watch it have a relationship. It's a relationship. It's like you don't have a relationship with CNN. You know, it's not like you wait. You, it's not like you know those people, or that you, if you saw them on the street, you could feel like you know them. And the same thing with MSNBC. But if you saw somebody from Fox News on the street, and this happens to me, people will just start in on a conversation with you, and they're like, and because you're in their living room all the time. I always call Fox the the, the aquarium because it's this blue box that's there all the time. <laughs> in your living room, it's just people just, my mom used to keep it on. And I used to joke that like Bill O'Reilly was the one fish that comes around three times. <laughs> here, here, comes, here comes the Bill O'Reilly repeat. There he is. And he stops, shakes his pen, moves away. Uh, but what's, okay, what's interesting about um, the relationship is that we've had a 75% what, turnover in, the, in prime time. We lost you know, three, uh, three major anchors, but the numbers are never higher. We keep doing better and better and better, and I do think it's because of the of the the fans more so than anything who um, have in, have invested in a relationship, and I think that's and, and we are generally I think a happy crew. Like uh, it's interesting people that I don't think I would get along with, I really like there. I mean, you get you sit. I mean, it is like the world's strangest surreal high school where you go into you go. There's Judge Janine sitting there, and she's like, "What am, what am I coming on your show?" <laughs> Liars, liberals, and leakers. And she's like, she'll be talking. And then Judge, Judge Napolitano comes in. Hello, Greg. It's not in the Constitution. And then he walks away. Everybody's like some character. They're all, and they're all like, and I, you know, I, you know, I always make fun of Kilmeade and his toupee. And um, <laughs> who else is there? But it's, it's just fun. No, it is kind of, it's, a, it's like an Archie comics. There's, there's different, and I guess I'm Jughead. 
I guess. <laughs> so, uh, is it ever awkward when you see Juan? No, you know, uh, you... <laughs> Juan's, great. Juan's great. I always say that, like, uh, you know, if, you're, if you have a Bond, there's no Bond movie without a nemesis. Yeah, you got to have a Bond villain. And so, if, 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 I always, if you want to just have pe- listen to two people talking to each other, then just listen to Nancy Pelosi talking to herself. You know, it's like <laughs> the, five, the, five would, the five would not exist if, if you didn't have Juan there to, like, you know, poke us. Because then it would just be, a, be it'd just be us talking to each other. We're like different. Let's face it, we're kind of different gradations of uh, right to libertarian, and you got to have somebody. And he has incredibly strong feelings about Trump. And it's like you. I mean, you talk about the two movies uh, idea that like you're wa- both of us are watching the same thing, but we're seeing two different movies. And that's what the same thing with Juan is like. Juan and I will watch the same thing, and we'll say two. We'll, we'll we'll be convinced we saw two different things. But I I try to see what he's seeing. I mean, he I mean, he just believes Trump is the is the worst bigot that's ever walked on the planet. And I have to look through that and see, okay, how is he seeing this? How can you change that? You know. Then you see him in the hallway afterwards. <laughs> If it's just the two of you heading in different directions, well, I give him a big shoulder block, <laughs> and I no, right. no, I think he, he's a boxer. I think he could take me. So right, I yeah. do not mess with Stay Juan. Away. No, but we all get along. We uh, everybody gets along. I'm trying to think of anybody that I can mention. See, this is the problem when something's on C-SPAN. Yeah, don't mention it. Yeah, I can't I'll mention go to the next stuff. Question. Yeah. All right, here's a, <laughs> a crowd pleasing question: When is Tyrus going to get his own show? Ah. Oh. I don't know, uh, but what a phenomenon. It's really weird. Okay, so uh, a number of people that I've hired were not through the typical, like uh, Andy Levy, if you remember Red Eye. I hired him because he left a comment on my blog uh, the Huff- when I was writing at the Huffington Post, which is the only example in the history of the universe of anything positive coming from a comment on a Huffington Post blog. <laughs> I mean, that's just like he, he was leaving. St- and I thought this guy's a good writer. So I met him in a bar in uh, Hell's Kitchen and he, d- he didn't, you know, he wasn't halfway ugly. So I thought maybe, yeah, maybe, you know, he give him, get, get him some clothes, you know. And then and Bill Schultz, you know, I just called him up. He was he was a features editor at, at Stuff Magazine. Tyrus emailed me out of the blue because he watched the show and just said hey i want to be on your show and so i just said okay and i look and i put him on youtube and i go this is interesting he's a a massive wrestler like a real wwf wrestler and i have him on and he like just the first show hit a home run and it was all about police brutality and and his whole thing was about compliance that like being 6 10 and weighing 400 pounds covered in tattoos compliance is everything so it's like when a cop pulls you over he's as scared as of me he's actually more scared of me than i and he and he, he had this great you can find it on facebook about what you have to do what what are your responsibilities in a situation with an officer and i just thought this guy is super thoughtful and every time he's on the show man he he kicks ass ever since he got the chair <laughs> I don't know what the symbols are that he does with his hands. I'd rather not know. <laughs> so if I know, I'd probably end up somewhere in a bag. All right, we're going to move to some of my questions here yes. and then get back to the uh, um, identity politics. Mm-hmm. You talk about it a lot. You yeah. don't like it. Yeah. Is there ever a place for it? Was I, there ever a place for it? I don't think so. I mean, all I know is identity politics prevents you from actually saying you're an American. Because you've created the oppression versus the oppressor versus oppressed paradigm, or whatever you want to call it, so that no matter what, America is always going to be the oppressor. You can't get out of that equation. And I just I I don't see anything good coming of it. I mean, it's like you can't be an American if you c- completely if if you're dividing groups into sections, and then they end up turning on each other. And you're seeing this now. And there are actual uh, uh, subgroups that don't like other groups and that are like, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so, it's, it's, it's so anti-individual. It's like we're eliminating the idea of who you are as a person and replacing it with who you are as a group. Well, I also feel, maybe you feel this way too, uh, I feel competitive and I feel like I need to be in a subgroup of short, bald guys, for example. <laughs> but every time I think about putting together a group and let, let's go protest, it just isn't a good look. No, it's not. 
Uh, I've right. had I've had this. I, I always thought like you know, okay, short people, right? There are studies that show that uh, um, almost all employment raises. Are, they're all dependent on height. Yeah. Do you see me out there screaming about that? No. But it's like, how many jobs have I lost because you know I'm five <laughs> eleven? You know, <laughs> like if I was just one inch, if I was just six feet. <laughs> I didn't even know I was short until I got into the employment world, until they said, oh, we didn't know you were that short. Not here on the resume. You should have to say that under other things and hobbies. Short, very short. But uh, I, I wrote a thing in the, one of my first books about um, there's no, like, like, some of the people that are discriminated the, the, against the most are, it's about looks. And no one will ever bring that up. You yeah. can't like, you know, but that's the thing. If you're, if, you know, there's, if you, I, I had a discussion with a, an actor about acne scars and about he, how like, you know, he ended up having to be a bad guy, you know, because that's all he could get was that. He couldn't be a leading man because he had acne. And um, I, it was back acne. Uh, <laughs> Terrible joke. Uh, Terrible joke. Uh, <laughs> Let me see your uh, back. Up, oh, you're out. <laughs> and that person was Tom Cruise. <laughs> Who, interestingly, is four foot eight. Yes, he is. Very tiny man. Very <laughs> tiny man. I sometimes cradle him. <laughs> like this. Uh, so here's a question that you might know that I've always, oh, I've always been curious about. So yeah, the, the media, except for Fox News and a few outlets, are very anti-Trump. Mm -hmm. Do they know it? Are they, are they aware of... Are, are they intentionally biasing their coverage... Or is it really what they feel? Is that how they see the world? I can't tell. I, I, I try to think about this in terms, because I got to be honest about, because I knew people that, like that about Obama, right? That were just so, like, Obama is the worst thing ever. And it's like, not really. It has, if, you just, if you just go out and live your life, 99% you, of your life is not going to be affected by this. Right. You might pay more taxes, but I think you're going to pay more taxes under Trump as well. You know, it's just, it's just, you know, people who are too close to the fire, of politics have no idea what how the rest of the world is. They have no idea. And I think that's what CNN is so close. By the way, CNN is culpable. They elected Trump. I mean, they gave him more uh, more coverage than anybody. They thought that Hillary had it in the bag, so let's let's have fun with this jerk. And then the jerk kicked their asses. And they're like completely like now they're I think it's a combination of a guilt complex because they fed the beast. And also they believe the beast is evil. So it's not, it's almost like a moral, uh, a moral crusade. It's like if, if like when I didn't vote for Obama, but I didn't think he was evil, I just thought he was wrong. So it wasn't a moral crusade. I, on Red Eye, I would make fun of the people, my, my peers who were joking about that, who were serious about the um, impeaching Obama and the birth certificate. So I would hyper pretend to be that way just as a joke. But I, but I, I never thought that he was evil. In this case, I do believe that they do think he's, a danger, even though that almost everything he does that bothers him is verbal, and none of it is actual deeds. Like that, I mean, to the, to, I mean, I don't know how you can, after the North Korea thing, how you can not, how, you got to look at him differently. That he did something like Obama's known for being audacious. That's the most audacious thing a president has done, just to say, "We'll see what happens." I'll meet with the guy. <laughs> I'll meet with the guy. You know, he's not a bad guy. <laughs> um, he's not a bad guy. But he under, like, I always say this, that like Trump was a uh, real estate contractor from Queens. He's dealt with worse. Like he had to talk, like you think Putin's bad, you know, talk to the mob in Brooklyn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he had to buy concrete from somebody. Somebody, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay. And that concrete wasn't just concrete. <laughs> <laughs> there was some guy in there like this. this filler. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so how, I don't. I forget who said this first, but how did it get to the place where the left th thinks that the right is evil and the right thinks that the left is stupid? Char uh, it was said by Charles Krauthammer, oh, right. who and uh, yeah, one of the one of the great minds passed away recently. Um, he uh, he he said it in a he said it in a column, I think, in the late. 80s maybe early 90s but he said like he goes diff that's the key difference it's this this moral uh belief that okay we when we, if i disagree with uh somebody i think it's because they're wrong or maybe stupid but they just think i'm evil and that allows for everything including violence so you'll have like you know a talking head on cnn defending antifa because they're in the moral you know they're 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 you know they're they're good 
even though they're hitting people with bike locks. You know, you can, you can excuse, it's weird, that kind of certainty, moral certainty can, ex, can excuse any behavior. All right, so uh, you talked about uh, education and college. Yes. Which used to be an awesome thing when I was young, but now it seems a little less relevant. Yeah. Would you tell somebody who is 15 today, get ready for college, or would you tell them maybe try something else? If it got him out of my house, yes. <laughs> But I, uh, I don't have any kids, so it's easy for me to say that, like, I would, I, like, I'm wondering, if I had kids, would I feel differently? But I do think, I do think college is, uh, is largely a phenomenal waste of time. But the problem is, it's virtue signaling now to corporations. I can say colleges are a waste of time, but none of these corporations are going to agree with me. And so what's happening is so you need to get a BA from a good school and a GPA. That's, uh, that's high. Now it's, that's not enough. You have to get a graduate degree. So it's, keep, it's, this, it's this educational virtue signaling that keeps getting higher. And that's why there's so much debt. It's because it used to be uh, maybe you didn't need a college diploma to get a good job. For some of these jobs, you didn't. But then maybe you had a two-year community you know, degree. That would be fine, et cetera. And then, but then what happened is we continued to build this, this pyramid uh, virtue signaling that, no, this person actually is a PhD and blah, blah, blah. He has an MBA and he's in total debt because of it. We'll hire him. And that's what's, I think, created this mess of people who are in debt. And, and, uh, and it would be great if corporations, that's why I like Peter Thiel. You know, Peter Thiel says, you know, he was doing these scholarships saying, don't go to college. I'll give you $100,000. See what happens. I think trade schools are important. I think there's going to be a lot of trade schools for building robots once they take over uh, <laughs> and adopt me as their overlord well let's talk about the robots because yes. I, I i saw in your book that uh you were pledging allegiance to our future yes. robot overlords yes um I, i'm on that camp too yeah whatever, whatever we can do to make them happy <laughs> exactly <laughs> robot in case but. It, it is no it is because it's like you know i don't want to i don't want them to when they're going through the list <laughs> <laughs> i want i want to be i want to be the benedict arnold I want to help them with the list of people that disobeyed robots. Well, well good, good luck because the list is alphabetical. <laughs> Adams, it's like, I, I got a little information about this one. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> you don't want him. No, but robots are better, robots are better versions of humans. And we, I, there's studies that show that like judges, if, uh, depending on their appetite will uh, deny parole uh, if, they're, if they're hungry. Uh, and if, they are, uh, if they're full, they will, they will grant you parole. Robots are never hungry, you know? So that's, that's really good for criminals. Uh, I, I have a theory that the reason that they can't make real artificial intelligence is because people aren't smart. <laughs> and, that, and that, you know, if you're the scientist, you can't actually say, all right, let's code the program. We'll just make him a freaking idiot. Yeah, and exactly. Then, this is going to fool everybody. <laughs> That's true. It's so true. And we don't know whether AI is already going on now just pretending. They could be pretending. Like your toaster oven could be totally cognizant right now. But just play, <laughs> pretending to be a toaster oven. Yeah. That... And then all of a sudden you're applying, you wake up one day and the appliances are surrounding you. No toast for you. <laughs> no toast for you. Your toast, as they say. The, I had another point. Terrible joke. I had another point about uh, robots and AI, and now I can't, but AI, AI is something that you can get totally lost on. Like, you can just think about it and go, okay, it's going to happen. But then it's like, you, it, but then I think it can't happen. I don't know how it can happen. I don't under, like, like, the only, the worst threat is a non-conscious thinking machine, right? It's like a machine that you program to do one thing, like the whole paperclip thing, like, you know, make paperclips. But it's non-conscious, so all it does is make paperclips until it destroys the world. It just looks at Scott Adams and goes, hmm, paperclip. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like, that's a, that's a Bostrom kind of thing. It's like a new, what was it, the name is Nick Bostrom. It's like the idea of non-conscious. That's, that's the threat. It's not this consciousness. It's that non-thinking, non-conscious thinking. I've lost myself on this. <laughs> Which is more likely? Intelligent robots will take over the world or we discover that we were a simulation all along and that we actually have always been programmed. Well, having listened to you, I know what your, that's a leading question, that it's probably a simulation. The argument is, is because there's just more, can you explain, 
the possible the reason why it, this is more likely to be a simulation is because there's just more possibilities for simulations. Yeah, whoever makes the first simulation probably will make more than one. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, if he makes two simulations, there are three things in the world, and two of them aren't real. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody in the other two think they're real as well. But what happens when they make their own simulations? Because yeah. they're, they're fully functional simulations. Yeah. It's kind of freaky. It's, and the funny thing about this is neither of us are high. <laughs> right? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not. I didn't. <laughs> there was no drug testing in my contract. <laughs> I don't know about you. I remember my favorite podcast was you and Joe Rogan. Lighting up. We were a little bit high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would never do that podcast. Three hours, I would, I would screw up at some point and my life would be over. Uh, I don't know how you do it. I'll tell you. The less I talk, the better. So, so uh, why is it? Here's another mystery I think you can clear up for me. Why is it that the world is full of dumb people, <laughs> but when Hollywood people talk about politics, they seem extra dumb in a way that's like yes, it's spectacular. A, it's endearing. What's up with that? It's like you know when a, you know what those people do those videos on YouTube where they show uh, babies things for the first time. You know those things like they show them like an ice cream and they show the face and everything. Oh, how adorable! That's that's Hollywood with politics, because. Um, they have spent a, a, a long period of their lives uh, ignorant, and then they finally get to a place where they have success, and they suddenly feel like, well, I'm not just a pretty face. And then they are in, politics is introduced to them, and their inexperience and lack of wisdom is inversely proportional to their passion. So the less they know about something, the more passionate they are, and that's how you were as a 15-year-old. So they have the, the Hollywood political mentality is exactly the same as a 15-year-old boy reading a comic book or, uh, or, get, or me, even me getting into politics when I was young, you were just, the emotion, make, it, it creates this certitude. And, and then, but then as you get older, like we, as I got older, I realized that I'm not right on, the more, cert, the more uh, certain I was, the less right I was, I found. <laughs> Strange. Now, all right. So let's, uh, we're going to go to the pile. Mm -hmm, the pile. I think we have some more coming from the audience here. Um, did you have a favorite monologue in the book? And you can pass on this because you may not have favorites. Is there a topic? I did. It's, what, like? What's interesting is that I think the largest chapter in there is uh, terror. And it was because during the period of that time of writing, ISIS was like, there were beheading videos constantly. There was horrible stuff going on. And I was writing maybe three monologues a week. It's interesting how that's, like, I look at the book and I go, that's not really there anymore. Uh, you know, the, the decision was made to suspend rules of engagement and just execute people. And then they just kind of went away. It will come back, though. And I do believe ISIS is still around. But I did one called terror week and I was because I was watching shark week and I thought how unfair it was to sharks it's like like they're, every night they're doing a different thing on sharks saying how bad they were and I thought let's do something on terror week and every night you do something new on a ter on a terrorist and I, that was kind of my way of saying focus our priorities all right um when you were at UC Berkeley were you a libertarian slash conservative then no uh, I don't know what I was. I, I, when I, okay, so I have to start. When I was at Sarah High School, I remember getting extra credit for doing something called the uh, campaigning for the nuclear freeze. It's for uh, Mr. Dell's religion class, sophomore year. And so I, I was just by default a liberal. Uh, it was a Jesuit uh, Catholic school, and the priests were very much into Central American politics. And we did a newspaper just devoted to Central America called uh, The Journal, which I'd written for. I mean, it was like, it was very leftist, but we didn't know it. So I was, uh, I wrote a, um, uh, uh, no, I did it. I got signatures for extra credit for the nuclear freeze. I would stand out in front of St. Gregory's in San Mateo and get signatures. And this nuclear freeze was just, um, to prevent nuclear arms from being transported in California. I think that was what it was. It's just absolutely absurd. It's like, I think they can find a way around this. <laughs> you know? But anyway, so... Um, so they, when I, they usually don't tell you when it's coming through, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Got a bomb a, coming through. Sort of a loophole. Well, you know, it's interesting. On 101, they do have a bomb lane. So it's like, it's really great. You just go right through. They wave you through. They got easy pass. Uh, but no, so, so my point, when I got to Cal, okay, so I wasn't, in a, I wasn't surrounded by a mob. 
And that's, I think, what affects me is not the po political ideology. It's the smell and scent of a mob. So when I got to Cal and I remember protests there, they might have been right. The protests might have been right. A lot of them were probably wrong, but some of them were right. I just didn't like that feeling of all the people shouting the same thing, and it made me really nervous. And that made me a conservative. A friend of mine, this guy Patrick, gave me a, ma a couple of magazines when I was there. Amer uh, American Spectator, which I ended up working for, and National Review. And I was going like, wow, I didn't know that other people thought like this. I didn't have – and it's kind of funny. Some of the stuff was funny. And then I was introduced to P.J. O'Rourke, uh, Republican Party Animal or Reptile was the name of the book. can't remember. But anyway, so I became a conservative. But then even being around conservatives, I found like a, a certain level of lockstep – there as well. So I kind of decided that I just wanted to pull myself out of anything and be able to look at uh, politics as an a la carte menu that I could be for pro legalization and be pro life. You know, you don't have to like be you, you don't have to follow the same thing. You know, I am I am basically legalization of all drugs, which doesn't sit well with most of my peers, but I'm too high to care. <laughs> Has uh, California gone, gone to hell compared to New York? Uh, what, what? It's neck and neck. It really is. I don't know. I, I, I feel like sometimes I'm too hard on California on the five, but it's because I love the place. And, uh, and like when I was in L.A. yesterday and the day before, and it's like when you see the tent cities, it's just mind-blowing because I never saw that before. So it's just a huge city in, in around Skid Row and then also off the off-ramps around Silver Lake. It's just insane. And I, I – and, you know, I told this story. Where was I? I was, I was on something. Maybe it was at a speech, and I, it's a gross story, but it was like the last time I was on a, coming out of BART with my mom, which was like six years ago, the escalator at, at Embarcadero Center was broken. And do you know why it was broken? Yeah, you know why, so I don't need to tell you. Anyway, it was human-caused. <laughs> but anyway, so they had to dig it. They had, it was full of stuff, human stuff. And so it was like, that's the problem. And, uh, and I think it's just sad that a beautiful city is becoming a latrine, you know. Well, okay. Is that too strong a word? <laughs> <laughs> you, know what that, you know what the problem is? It's a fear of past, like, concern is now being construed as passing judgment. Like, you can be concerned about somebody's mental health, that's not passing judgment. And I talk about this, about institutionalization uh, and why that, the deinstitutionalization has been a problem for New York and for the United States. And it's like, I'm not passing judgment. I'm actually expressing concern for people who are out on the street who have serious problems. But now if you express any kind of concern about that, you're somehow passing judgment on people and you're either, you're just an awful person, which is, that's been, that's been I think, the big barrier Speaking of awful people, yes. Uh, in your book, you you suggested that maybe there should be something like an online amnesty for bad tweets or things you've done on social media. Yes. Um, tell us about that. Like, could we really have a world where we could just say, "Yeah, you did say that five years ago," but I, that was five years ago. I hope so, because I'll tell you what. Everybody here who's in my generation is lucky as hell. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, my God, there might be some pictures out there, <laughs> but I mean, they were like they were like they were from those terrible cameras. You can't see anything. No, but I mean, it's like young uh, young kids these days. They don't know that they could ruin their lives. They could ruin their careers just by like doing stupid stuff and taking a picture of it, or having a bad day. If you have one bad day, if you get in, if you're a parent and you spank your kid at Walmart and somebody, I call it, I, 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 my next book is tentatively called a, a Nation of Narcs because all we are, we're just doing this to each other <laughs> and then we're posting it and I got you. But the thing is, we're going to get you too. That's the problem is that it's all, you're, we're all going to destroy each other. So I have a theory, which I'm, I wrote this piece that's coming out tomorrow and it's because I'm agnostic. It's kind of, bizarre coming from me but i do believe social media needs a mass because the whole point of mass is that you have this ritual of a crucifixion so other people don't get crucified christ died for your sins so other people don't and because before that that's that's what people did and so it was like every day you simulate a crucifixion a forgiveness and people get on so you have that in real life but that's not that doesn't exist in the life of social media which is why every 
three or four days, there's an actual crucifixion, not actual, there's a metaphorical crucifixion. Somebody says something stupid, they lose their job. Uh, somebody makes a joke, they're fired, uh, um, but they're banished and everybody enjoys it. The mob, really, it feels really good to banish somebody. It does. And that's why, you know, Christ, I, in my, this is my theory. And I'm, again, I'm not religious and agnostic, but I did 12 years of Catholic school. I learned a lot of things. Some I can't tell you. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, but that's, I, I feel like that was the solution for real life mobbery. And, and, and to get rid of that in life, and I think that's what's necessary now. All right, question from the audience. Is there a way to bring back civility to the political conversation? And I'll add my own commentary. Wouldn't that ruin all of your shows? Yes. <laughs> okay, so this goes back to the... Okay, if is civility on social media... It's incivility on social media replacing incivility on the street. So that like, uh, I, I, instead of, I'm gonna be a jerk to Scott Adams, and that way I won't be a jerk to Scott Adams when he's parking his car. I don't know, because we do know that violence overall is on a decline, right? It's been on a tr dramatic decline. Right. We're becoming less violent, but we're becoming crueler, right? So I don't know if it's translating, if the civility question, if we, if we should be, if we are, like, okay, we had higher murder rates when we were more civil, right? Does that make sense? Did we? Yeah, yeah we did, right? Yeah, like yeah. the 50, I mean, I'm, well, the 50s was pretty quiet, 60s, but we were probably did a lot of yes sirs and no sirs and yes ma'am and holding doors, but then killing each other. <laughs> but I do think, I do think that we have, I mean, the murder rates, are, with the exception of a few cities, are pretty, are low. I mean, you know, I don't know any murderers. <laughs> The whole, you? the whole door holding thing makes me want to kill people. <laughs> uh, when like you're a, far away or when you have to? <laughs> either one. Either one. You're like, oh, the 20 feet? Yes. 20, yes. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. There has to be a rule. <laughs> All right. Um, so we don't need any civility. I don't think we need that. I don't know. It's underrated and overrated. That's the thing. I can't make up my mind. I feel like if you made two changes to social media, you solve everything. One, one of them would be you can only have access to everybody on social media if you show your real identity. Yes, I agree. And number two, the 48-hour rule, mm. which is if you say something provocative or stupid, or even if you mean it, you've got 48 hours to change it, and the, and the, and the clarification has to rule. Yeah. We just agree that we don't read your mind. Yeah, exactly. No, Solve that's all problems. I, yeah. Probably never would happen. I always thought that would be, it, using this Christ metaphor, what would happen if you just decided one day to tweet the most awful thing you could think of? Just what would happen? And then say it was just an experiment. <laughs> 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 I don't know. I thought that that would be a way to like, like say, okay, I did that on purpose, but I probably a stupid idea. <laughs> I won't do it yet till, I'm, till I have FU money like Scott <laughs> and a bunker. <laughs> like Scott. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is your greatest fear about our country and the world? Uh, oh, I would always say terror, but I'm like, I feel pretty good. I mean, I think the way I make fun of people about climate change, people could make fun of me about terror change because I always talk about terror change that it's like it's constantly evolving. I have terror on my brain probably because of 9-11. I've been in I was in New York in 9-11. I was in England in 7-7. Uh, that was around the corner for me. So I think I have like a, um, I don't know, a, you know, I have a phobia, maybe not a phobia, but a concern. And that will always probably be. So that's always, my thing is technology married to terror. And you've talked about this too, about like open air events with right. drones and drones and bio agents. You marry that, uh, you do it over a football game. That's it. And it's like even the Vegas thing, was people, terrorists learn from previous acts. And if you look at what happened in Vegas, that was like, a, that was a static drone. He was at a hotel right. over a group. And I think that's like, I look at, I, I think about this stuff way, way more than I should, you know, sorry to bring everybody down. <laughs> so what about unicorns? You have any questions about unicorns? Well, what is, what is your greatest joy or hope? What, what is there that's going right in the world that's underrated? Like what? Mm. He has nothing positive to say. We'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> I, the Atkins diet. Big fan of the Atkins diet. Okay. I like those Change new shakes that Rob Lowe's selling. <laughs> oh, they're amazing. How do you stay so thin? Are you uh, vegetarian? Uh, pescatarian. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I hate fish. 
It's a, I always, I mean, it's the world's toilet. I mean, why are you eating that stuff? <laughs> it is. Well, I'm not a pescatarian anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, the re I only eat meat because, like, I look at a cow and I don't see a steak. Right, I just see, I see a cow. But if you look at fish, you go, oh, I, you see it. Like, you see what you're eating. I find that uncomfortable. Uh, here, here, Stupid eyes. Here's a question from Marianne and Niles Hansen from Sarah High School 68. Wow. The Padres, P-P-P-A-D. Uh, no, you can't say that anymore. And they, they say, they note that Jesse Waters' mother watches her show. Yes. Uh, has your, is your mom alive? No, she passed away about uh, five years ago. Okay, has she ever... Thanks for the question, bringing up that. <laughs> What a downer. Greg, your mom died. But Do you miss her? Was she, Next question. Was she alive during Red Eye? Oh, yeah, she was great. Uh, my mom, uh, I always used my mom in all my jobs. So when I was an editor at Men's Health, she had an advice column. And it was really popular. And nobody knew, nobody thought it was real because you couldn't make up her answers. Because <laughs> they were just so, like, bizarre. And then she would leave when I worked, was editor-in-chief of Stuff Magazine. I would just do her verbatim answering machine messages as she, when we had answering machines where she would critique the magazine and how awful the, the women looked in their bikinis. And there'd be, it'd be, like, really long. But people loved it. When I got to Red Eye, I had... Uh, I, it was called Greg's mom and I would call her and it would be a segment and just talk to her about politics and she's in her 80s and she just and there were uh, there were great moments when like people would show up at the door while she's doing it and it would be she would just like I'm busy and she'd <laughs> slam the door uh, and then she would tell she would tell crazy stories about stuff and it was just like uh, it was nuts I mean in in uh, but it was a lot of fun and then also she was she would criticize the show severely mainly about what the women wore So do you have siblings? Yeah, I got three older sisters. Okay I think one of them is in the audience because one of the questions is how much do your siblings hate you? Ah uh. <laughs> I, they don't, I don't think they, they. I don't think they hate me. Uh, Are they jealous of your massive success? Yeah, of course. Why wouldn't they be? Good. <laughs> no, I don't think. I think actually they get. They probably get more pleasure out of my work than I get pleasure out of my work. <laughs> I, I have to think about this stuff. They can just go. Oh, that's my brother. <laughs> that's my brother. No, everything's great. We all get along for now. Could uh -huh. change at any minute. All right, um, have you ever met President Trump? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, uh, <laughs> what was that like? Um, <laughs> this is so funny. First, before I tell my story, I have to say that I, I, I DM'd Scott. I go, hey, Donald Trump called me last, it was like, it was like two weeks ago. He called me just to say hello. And he's like, yeah, was, he, he goes, you know, uh, hey, Greg, what's up? Love your show. Stop by whenever you want. I, so I go, Scott, this, isn't that great? And Scott writes, hey, congratulations. You know, good, that's great. And then the next day, there's a picture of Scott with the president. <laughs> and it was like, he was like, he didn't know, like, it was like, it was like it's like saying, hey, I found 20 bucks here. And the, and the guy says, well, I got the winning lottery ticket <laughs> for $55 million. But I met him. He used to call me after Red Eye. So he was talking like eight years ago. He would call me and talk about the show because he's up all night. He doesn't drink. So he loves, and he just would talk about, he knew everything. About, and he was so sweet and nice to me, which is why I always felt bad about how I treated him. And I ended up uh, doing a speech in Mar-a-Lago uh, like in 2015 with Alan West and flew back with, my wife and I flew back with Trump on his plane. And he, all he does, he just eats sweets and watches, he was watching an Elton John concert. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a child he's, he's, but he was such a, he, he was so normal and charming and everything and then I ended up going a couple of days before uh, he declared I went to uh, Trump Tower and hung out with him and uh, we were talking about me do, being his press spoke, spokesman did a segment on it and everything and, uh, and everything was great and then like then it started and I was like when he came, went down the escalator and then uh, I kind of like became I, I was be, became a very critical person. And then we, we didn't talk at all until uh, like two weeks ago. And when will we hear your secret recordings of your yes. with the president? <laughs> I should have. Oh my God. The stuff he told me. But how was your... You were at, you were at, you were at uh, well, the White House, what, last week, two weeks ago? Yeah, let me tell me my version of the story you just heard, which is... I've been invited to the White House by the president, and then Greg DMs me, as you just heard, and say, hey, the president just called me. And I'm like, what do I say? <laughs> you know, there's, there's like 
thousands of years of you know, evolution of manners, so we've got every, every situation covered from when do you use your cell phone. We got everything covered, but not this, <laughs> not this. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I'll just say congratulations. I guess the rest will come out later. Yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah. I, I, the next day I go, you asshole. <laughs> you, why did you say something? I feel like such a schmuck. There was no way to do it. No, there was no, no way, way to do it. it. it was, no, you were very polite. All right. <laughs> Let's go back to the questions. We've got six minutes left. Um, do you think, what do you think changed your opinion of Trump in, uh, as things went? You know, um, was I, there anything that specifically that turned you? Um, him winning. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I, I, had, I, I decided to, to rewind and start over and go deeds, not words. That was just it. It was like, okay, so you're not, you're not, you, you got to accept the personality for what it is. He's not going to change. He's, you could say, I wish he wouldn't tweet as much. He's not going to listen. He's going to insult people. That's who he is. And he got that from doing all those comedy central roasts and being the targets. He knows what he's doing. He's from, he's a New York contractor from Queens. That's who he is. Watch the deeds. And that has, and as, as long as, as long as I maintain focus on that, it's been really a consistent kind of enjoyment. You know, I mean, sure, every now and then, if you could be exhausted if you followed everything that happened with him, you would, you, it's not healthy. There's a whole world out there, you know? <laughs> Just focus on the deeds. That did, and also I had to recognize my own hypocrisies that I was like, he's redefining what a president can do and, and he's basically acting like somebody on a talk show. And, and I had people at Fox, and I won't mention their names, O'Reilly, but uh, that said, <laughs> Why didn't I? He goes, he, well, I, he said, like, why didn't I run? Like, that's what he said. He, and he wasn't joking. He was just like, okay, so he was watching what was happening with Trump. And he was like, I could have done it. I could have done it. Not me, but O'Reilly said that. And then uh, I said, nah, not in your life. <laughs> um, what about climate change? <laughs> Would you say that climate change is science or a cult? Um, both. I'd say there is science. I say that the climate models are often wrong, but I'm always willing to change my mind and be proven wrong. But I don't think, I think the cult is in, uh, I don't think it would be called a cult. I guess I would say that you, ha in order to kind of save your career in some ways and in, in certain departments, you have to adhere to a certain belief. So if you're a critical of it, you could be in trouble. And that's kind of a definition of a cult is that if you, can't, if, you, if you step out of line, you could be in trouble. So I do think there is a climate change, uh, I would say, um, I don't want to say, cult's not the word, but it's something. Hysteria. Well, yeah, hysteria. Yeah. But I do, believe that there, I do believe that there could be something going on, and, but I keep, looking at this, I keep on looking at the climate models and realizing that they're always off. So I'm always very, I think, here's what bugs me. You're supposed to be skeptical about everything. So why can't I be skeptical and, and about the, the models and be open about it? So I'm not, I don't like calling it a hoax because I don't think it is. Uh, I just think you could be, you could, I'm a, I'm a, I don't know if you follow Bjorn Lumber, Lumborg from the, uh, uh, the Copenhagen Consensus. He's my guy. He's like, he's a lukewarmer, you know? He's right in the middle and, he believe, and he's figured out like $27 trillion could, could uh, basically cure every ill in the world. And that's why the, the climate uh, summit was so bad because it was $100 trillion and moving you know, the, the, the degree like that. So I thought it was a waste of money. That was a convoluted answer. All right. Well, we could do a whole time on climate change, but yes. we, we won't. Nobody likes climate change as a topic. It I got know. really quiet. Yeah, you know, you, do it, on, you, you no, do it on no. TV and the, and the ratings just go. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's why I asked, because it seems like the emotion is so much higher than what anybody actually knows. Yeah, exactly. Like, we, like, we don't know. No, how, we how don't do know. We, how would we know anything about climate change? No, and it cha it's constantly changing. That's why they call it climate change, Scott. <laughs> All right, uh, we got two minutes, uh, and that means we're gonna we're gonna go to our final question. Oh, uh, okay. Final round. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> um, if you're looking forward to 2018, yeah. Do you see the blue wave, red wave? What do you think for the midterm elections? I see a purple nurple. <laughs> slightly blue, slightly red. You know, purple. Is that what purple is? I don't know. I think there. I think okay. It's understood that. 
the, the people who have most to gain are the people out of power. It always happens. They always gain seats. So you got to adjust your, uh, your, your assumptions that it's not going to be the greatest thing. Uh, so I do see that they will, they will gain some seats. Maybe, we'll, maybe the Republicans will hold on to the Senate. But a lot, of, a lot of Republicans aren't running again in the Democrats, so, I mean, in the, uh, the Congress. So I do, I, I do think that they will make, gain some ground. It may not be a bad thing. I've heard data say on the five that maybe Trump would do better if the Republicans did not hold Congress. Yeah, because her, I guess her belief is that he, will, he would work better with a Democratic House. I think that was her theme. As a deal maker, yeah. Yeah, as a deal maker, because he'll make a deal with anybody, as we can tell. I mean, it's like, he, if, he, if he can deal with Kim Jong-un, he can deal with Pelosi. So, it, by the way, the same Taylor, so you know. That. <laughs> <laughs> so it, seem, it seems to me. Terrible. terrible, terrible. I think I've lost my closing statement here. I'll find it in a minute. Um, it seems to me that he may have done all the things that he can do by himself yeah, with a unified Congress, like by now. Right. You know, war and economics and, you know, executive orders and, mm -hmm. and getting out of the climate treaty, et cetera. But the next stuff, like an, an immigration reform or yeah. health care, you kind of need both sides. Yeah, no, that's why he hasn't had the, hasn't, you know, achieved anything with the wall, even though he gave... He was giving a lot away, I thought. I mean, it was like, one, I think it was 1.2 million dreamers were going to get in, and, but they weren't going to do it. They, had, they couldn't give him that. <laughs> All right. It looks like we've, we've come to our closing moment here. This is where we sing. Uh, <laughs> yes. I have to so pee. Here's where I say... Why I don't uh, drink beer. Uh, our thanks to Greg Gutfeld, Fox News personality and author of the new book, The Gutfeld Monologues, Classic Rants from the Five. We also thank our audiences here and on radio and television and the internet. I'd like to remind everyone here that Greg's book is for sale outside and who will be pleased to sign books I will. in this room following the program. We appreciate everyone staying seated at the end for book signing instructions. I'm Scott Adams, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. <laughs>